Welcome to the Thrivalist Manifesto with Ben V and Dr. G. Hey, everyone. How do you like that intro music? The in- I'm, I'm blown away. Like, I'm just <laughs> sitting here and I felt like I was like in a jazz lounge somewhere, like Minton's in Harlem yeah. somewhere, just chilling out and having a glass of wine, you know? <laughs> Some, but maybe we should have wine that, when we do this absolutely. podcast. Absolutely. That sure. energy is just great. That it, yeah. I mean, the lead in is, is, is fantastic. Yeah. All right, so today we're going to be talking about one of our foundational uh, components. When I say foundational, what I mean is there's some concepts you're going to hear in our podcast. I think it's going to be a running thread regardless of what we're talking about over, over the next, uh, you know, the future of this podcast. And uh, what I mean by foundational is these are going to be things that principles in biology, principles in psychology, principles that are just... Um, you know, going, it's just going to be a running thread uh, moving forward. So this principle is called hormesis. Have you heard the word hormesis before, Ben? I have heard the word hormesis. Yeah. And every time I hear the word hormesis, I have to remind myself that it's a physiological right. term. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hormesis is basically, um, it's a used word. It, it's a used, it's used in biology in particular uh, to describe the beneficial effects of low-level exposure to an agent that would be otherwise toxic or injurious at a higher dose. Um, But there are beneficial effects to something, a low dose of something that would otherwise be toxic. Correct. And and this, you might say to yourself, how could something that's poisonous at really low doses be beneficial to you? Um, and I say poison is just in the in the uh, in the broader sense. And when we say agent, it's important for the audience to understand that we're not just talking about hormesis relative to a chemical compound, which right. we are, but we're talking about the actual physiological adaptation mm-hmm. in response to a an outside uh, stimulus or an outside stress. Right. So so we can have a hormetic response. A hormesis type response to exercise. We could have a hormesis type response to a medication or a nutritional supplement or a a botanical, an herb. Um, There are hormetic responses to, um, you know, different agents in in food, right? Uh, Turmeric. um, And these are kind of like Mother Nature's way of of protecting all of its life forms uh, from. From from da- damaged from insects, damage from from anything. So if, for example, there's a whole uh, industry or a, a whole n- knowledge base of of growing di- different botanicals in environments that are stressful. So for example, with wine, uh, they you know the wine makers learn that if we create an environment that's very rough for the vines to to grow, mm-hmm. but they can grow, but it's very difficult. The grapes are much bigger and juicier and more full of resveratrol and more full of sugars and things that, that would make the, the grape desirable to a winemaker. So how, do that, how does that work in the human body and how does that work with us? Well, there's all kinds of applications for this, right? Um, hormetic applications uh, in, in, in medicine, in functional medicine, in exercise, in high performance, that's kind of where I want this conversation to go. Nice. So, you know, I just, uh, on, on two extremes, you can take a very low dose of a medical compound that's done for hormetic reasons. That would be one extreme to elicit a, let's call it like a, a, an, an immune response mm-hmm. in the body that the end goal is to improve the immune function. That's one end. And then on the other end, the audience can think of it as, a horm- it can be uh, defined as a hormetic stress, uh, what the uh, SEALs call Hell Week, which is a progressive exposure to stressors that keep increasing and increasing and increasing that allow those potential SEALs to um, to develop. You know, it's like that principle, that which does not kill me is only going to make me stronger. And that's what the audience can interpret as a, an extreme hormetic response. So just to give an example in my own life of how I've, uh, of how I've applied this. Um, so cold exposure, 
right? Mm-hmm. Cold exposure is something that is is believed to have some good physiological uh, benefits, right? Mm-hmm. But if you expose yourself to the cold, you know, we're worried about frostbite, you know, uh, catching a cold, you know, that, that that's nonsense. You don't, you don't catch a cold. Uh, but the, the point is, if you walk out of your house barefoot into, you know, six inches of snow, it won't be long before your feet start feeling not only cold, but a lot of pain. Right. And um, so you, if, if you've been following the podcast world, uh, a lot of people have been talking about Wim Hof out of um, Europe. And Wim Hof is the Iceman. Mm-hmm. Wim Hof uh, saw at a time in his life when he was very depressed, his wife had passed away. He kind of felt this. He was compelled to make himself cold. He didn't know why. He just did. Mm-hmm. And he started to do things that would increase his exposure. He found himself feeling better when he would have this cold exposure. Mm-hmm. Now, Wim Hof, just to bring you uh, up to speed, this guy has done a marathon in the Arctic Circle in nothing but shorts. Yeah, no, I've Barefoot. read a little bit about him. He's amazing. He had been exposed to, he was, they buried him up to his neck in ice. I think he was there for 80 minutes or so. His arm was sticking out so the doctors could pull blood to, to measure his, his blood chemistry and the effects. And fit, he, he defied all of the doctor's um, expectations of what would happen to somebody in that environment to the point where he used to say, I could control my immune system. Mm-hmm. Now, we know the immune system is a innate response. You don't really control it like you would control your left arm. But uh, he said he can control it. So what they did was they injected him with a immunotoxin, uh, a lipopolysaccharide, something that that would give us a fever, chills. You know, it would give us that whole flu experience temporarily. Right. So they injected him with it, and nothing happened. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Yeah. So when all the researchers were done with him, the basic <laughs> conclusion was we can't draw any conclusions about human health from this guy because he's a freak. Mm-hmm. He's just a freak. Mm-hmm. And Wim Hof said, no, I, I could pretty much train anybody to do this. And that's what he started doing. He started training people to, regular people, to go spend two weeks with him and learn how to do this in a comfortable way. They hang out outside in the snow and they climb mountains barefoot and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, he swam in, so they went to a lake, a frozen lake, cut a square out a hundred yards apart, and he swam from one square to the other underneath. Um, mm. And again, you know, without any without any negative detrimental effects to his physiology. Mm. All right. So, what does this mean to to, to me? Because I'm not going to go to his camp this year yet. Maybe I'll I'll go. But yeah, I, we both I, need to go and do a podcast from his camp. I think uh, he's coming to New York next this year. Oh, seven. Yeah, that it would be great to have him <clears throat> on because he has mm. some great insight as, as as to what actually is happening. He's been working with researchers. He'd be able to elaborate on a lot of things. But what I've been doing, just learning about him, uh, is just going out outside first thing in the morning mm. there's a lot of reasons why i think it's beneficial to do that just letting your brain know that it's you know letting the the morning sun hit your face mm-hmm. or the morning daylight hit your face telling you you know where you are in the earth you know uh t- the sun will tell you where you are in the earth what season it is what time it is there's benefit there so i would go barefoot in a pair of shorts and no shirt all year round so in the winter time there's snow in my backyard i'm standing there in the snow as long as i can take it Mm -hmm. i usually when i first started it would be february and i'd be out there for like 15 seconds Mm -hmm. now i don't care what temperature it is uh if it's 22 degrees i'm out there i could stay out there for a long period of time and even with my feet in the snow that pain you get from from being really cold right that pain you experience is because the muscles in your arteries and particularly in your veins We have muscles in our veins. Mm -hmm. They respond to temperature changes, right, in Mm -hmm. order order to protect you. So what happens is they experience the cold Mm -hmm. and those veins constrict. Right. The blood's going to your more important organs. That's right. You you, you, you move your blood towards your core. Mm -hmm. But in your extremities, that pain you're experiencing, well, what happens if you never use a muscle? And you, mm. and you start using it a lot. Atrophy. It hurts. Oh, it well, hurts, right. I it, understand. It right. hurts. Mm-hmm. So if you if you don't lift weights and then you start doing 50-pound curls with dumbbells and you mm. overdo it, mm. you're going to create a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. So the same thing occurs with, with, with your veins with cold exposure, mm. and that's why my feet would hurt so much. Mm. 
So after, now I can stand out there for five minutes in the snow, mm -hmm. drinking a cup of tea. My feet don't hurt because those muscles have been adapted, right? They, they had a hormetic response. They adapted, got stronger, and now I don't experience that lactic acid buildup in those mu muscles the way I did before because now those muscles mm -hmm. are better adapted and they expect some mm -hmm. kind of stress. Yeah, there's a, there's a ton of research that's going on and uh, people have given it different names, but it's essentially uh, uh, voluntary discomfort, mm -hmm. they're calling it. So right. basically it's either cold exposure or heat exposure. And so they're looking at not just the physiological response to it or adaptation to it, but they're also looking at the psychosocial adaptation to it. So right. what you perceive to be extreme cold temperatures and how that changes based on your ability to adapt physiologically. Right. And, and, and I guess that can be defined as hormesis as well. Absolutely. So mm. my in my uh, house, you know, because I, I get the benefit of the real cold being out, outside only mm -hmm. in the winter months, but... Um, all year round, I'm, I finish my shower with a cold shot, right? So mm -hmm. I'm ready to get out of the shower. It's a nice warm shower. Woke me up. All right, great. I turn it all the way to cold and I just take it. <laughs> <First> time, <laughs> How loud are you screaming? Well, here, here's the thing. It, it started that. It started that way. And I, mm. I would, my, basically my policy was as soon as I get that major chill and, and, you know, you, your, your breath in that you can't control and you start breathing heavy, heavy. That's when I, I would stop, and that would 10, 15 seconds. It's interesting you say breath because when I've done it and I'm I'm just starting to do it, like I'll start at, you know, 30 seconds, as cold as I can take right. it, the difference maker is the breath. As soon as I focus on the breath, it changes my ability or the time that I can take the, the cold exposure. In, in Wim Hof's training, mm -hmm. breath is everything. It's all about the breath. Right. Matter of fact, that... There is a breathing technique that you would do while you're d doing the cold exposure, but also how, as a way just before the exposure mm. uh, to kind of start build, building up the heat in your system. But now I'm up to two minutes and my temperature uh, on, on my shower gets, gets to 57 degrees. Wow, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty darn cold. Right. Um, I think I got it to 54 degrees once, you know, but that was in the, in the winter time. And so, so for the audience, when you do that up to two minutes, what are you, what kind of changes have you noticed? Well, Cognitively, all, physiologically? Right off the bat, you get out of the shower completely invigorated. I mean, you, you, it, it is a double shot of espresso. You know, it has that kind of an effect on your energy. Okay. Uh, on, on the subject of hormesis and, and, you know, making yourself mildly uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be for long periods of time. I mean, we're talking about five-minute exposures or 30-second exposures, and that works as long as you do it with repetition. Um, also, uh, saunas. Yeah, you know, big heat, one. Uh, And, you know, there's all kinds of information on heat shock proteins and, and things that are released. Um, as That's a future response. episode, but the, the yeah. sauna is one thing that I've been researching for a while, and there, there is, and when we say sauna, I mean the dry finish type right. sauna not the infrared sauna because that research is a little questionable well, i i mean there there's different reasons to do infrared sauna so it, it, it's mm -hmm. not the uh hormesis or the uh discomfort reason to do the in the infrared infrared has great benefit in driving uh nitric oxide um dri driving uh immune mechanisms glutathione production so there's there's reasons to do far and near in infrared therapy as well, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll we'll of course be discussing that moving forward. But um, just from like what you're talking about, the Finnish or the Russian banya type saunas, where you got to wear that 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 cone on your head to yeah, you the, prevent the your scalp from hat. burning. Yeah, they beat the crap, and out then of they you beat with you the, up with branches. With branches, yeah. <laughs> I never got that one. Like I'm like I don't know. I'm I'm here to relax. Like, I don't really. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass on the beating today. I, I've done it, and I love it. Yeah, you like that? Taking a beating yeah. is great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess You know, so. here in New York, we have Little Odessa, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know where Little Odessa is, I know is, where it right? is, yeah. Brooklyn. Little Odessa is in Coney Island, yeah. and it's right on the water, and there's the, little, there's the mermaid spa, hardcore traditional Russian banya. Mm. They have a whole big giant family room. People go there. They bring food. They spend the day. They drink vodka. I know. A lot of vodka. 
it's amazing because when you're sweating it out all all, all yeah, day, you, you can just drink keep it drinking, all day. right? Yeah. <laughs> when I go, I, I avoid the vodka. <laughs> the guys I hang out with, they bring the vodka. Mm -hmm. But I go with some traditional Ru Russian uh, people and um, have them beat the shit out of my feet, my legs with the uh, with with the branches. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite an experience. But what's great about it is they have different saunas. Mm -hmm. Steam, sauna, cold plunge, ice sauna. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you go there, you hang out, you talk with your friends, you get a table, uh, you meet people, it's great. And then you go through your cycle. You go from a sauna to a steam to a cold plunge to a cold sauna mm -hmm. to a hot tub. And you spend about 20 minutes going through the cycles. And then you go back to your table, sit down, eat, talk, eat, talk. There's salads you can order it's it's really a great experience mm -hmm. um but again going through these cycles of making yourself uncomfortable, uncomfortable and yeah. letting the body respond has a powerful impact oh yeah on no. on your health and again it's 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 you have to train through it for the audience it's not like well you go to a dry sauna and you spend a half hour oh. in the sauna it's like there's a protocol yep. you know you might start at five minutes and uh there's We'll, we'll be doing a podcast on it, but there's amazing physiological benefits to the sauna. Yeah. You know, everything from VO2 max, uh, increasing your aerobic endurance, to now they're seeing, um, uh, there's a couple of studies on mortality rates and sauna usage. So we'll, we'll be covering that in the future. But yeah, that's, uh, that falls right in line with what we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, if we if we try to ask the question, you know, who could benefit from, you know, somebody might be listening to this podcast saying, you know, I'm I'm 40 plus years old. I, I used to be an athlete. I, I I work out on the weekends. I don't really feel that good. I've had a couple of knee operations. Uh, my energy's down. Doctors telling me I got, you know, mm -hmm. blood pressure or cholesterol issues. You know, that chronic I don't feel good itis is starting to set in. Mm -hmm. um, and then you may have somebody who's all, you know. 22 years old, they're performing at the highest level. They're a Division One collegiate athlete, and they want a, an edge on their on their competitors, mm. uh, their their opponents, um, and they want to use these principles. And then you got people who are, you know, they're 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 about to retire. Uh, they might be in their late 60s, early 70s. They feel great. They have money. They want to travel the world, and they want to be fit and able to do these things. I I, I think we are talking to all three of those groups. No question about you know, it. Um, and and where you start, you know, and, and in our show notes, we're going to be putting articles and, and research that kind of backs up a lot of the things that we're talking about here. But it, it, it's important to kind of give yourself a program. I usually like to do things over three months mm -hmm. and then kind of say, all right, here's where I was before. Here's where I am after. This is what I found valuable to me in my life. Right. And that's what I'm going to keep and I'm going to put into my schedule. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've been doing lately, you know, Ben, is uh, I've been doing a lot of intermittent fasting. Yes. And again, very hot topic. But that's hormesis. It's the same thing, making mm -hmm. yourself mildly uncomfortable by being hungry or, or not eating mm -hmm. um, and, and creating a physiological response. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, just, I mean, we've been talking about ketosis for a long time. We've been talking about um, the, you know, the benefits of that, but the research on fasting is out of this world when it comes to performance, mm -hmm. when it comes to you know, autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. and when it comes to cancer. Yeah, it's funny because this was brought to my attention probably 13 or 14 years ago. And it was brought by an osteopath that we'll talk a lot about, Dr. Guy Voyer, and he spoke about uh, intermittent fasting, but he spoke about periodic fasting of just water, like built into your 12 month calendar. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how it was a commonplace in Europe, uh, you know, in certain societies, it was for ages now. So when I looked into it, I, I, I realized that in North America, we were the only culture that didn't at some point in the year whether it be for cultural or religious reasons, do any kind of fasting. And now all of this research is coming out as to the benefits of fasting um, from a recovery standpoint. Right. And so that's, I mean, including what you're doing, which is intermittent fasting. But just for the audience, this is not something that's trendy. This is something that's been embedded in cultures and religions 
since the beginning of time. So if there, I, I can't remember, I, I want to give credit to the author who, who said this because uh, I, I just can't remember the book that I read this in. But he said, what, he asked the question, what does Muhammad, Jesus, and Buddha all have in common? And the answer is they've had major religious experiences of, you know, um, self-actualization while fasting. Mm-hmm. They all have fasting uh, in their, pro- and all of the, all those religions mm-hmm. have fasting in their doctrine. Correct. Um, so there's great, I mean, R- Ramadan, of course, is a is, is a, 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 an example where there's 30 days of intermittent fasting. Right. Um, and, and of course, there are, uh, you know, I, I grew up Greek Orthodox, and, and there's a whole 40 days of a certain type of fasting that is done in the Greek Orthodox religion, mm-hmm. um, you know, prior to Easter and other times of the year. So I, I think it's because over the centuries, over the millennia, People saw the benefits that, you know, being in a fed state is good and healthy for you. Mm -hmm. Being in a fasting state is good and healthy for you. And alternating between the two is actually appropriate. Mm -hmm. So you might say, all right, well, how does that relate to to us? Well, we live in 2017 USA Mm -hmm. and our whole lives we've been able to wake up to a refrigerator. Yeah, there's an abundance of food, specifically after the agricultural revolution, let's call it. What I always say is if you only, if if fasting were so good for you, Mm -hmm. then why eat? Just fast and you'll be the healthiest person in the world and just never eat ever again. Mm -hmm. Well, if you did that, of course, you'd starve and die. Mm -hmm. And then if we say, all right, then feeding is good for you. Then just do what we've been doing here in the United States for the last couple hundred years. And that is feed all the time. Just Mm -hmm. be in a constant fed state. Well, that causes problems too. And you will get sick and die. So Mm -hmm. if we look at being in a fed state results in cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, stroke, Alzheimer's. I mean, being in a nonstop fed state causes 95% of what we're paying as in, in our health bill mm-hmm. as a nation. Mm-hmm. So feeding is not good for you. Fasting is not good for you. But fasting to feeding, fasting to feeding, that's the what seems to be the best thing for the human body. Controlled. Yeah. Controlled fasting. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of research going on right now in different parts of the country, different parts of the world on on all of the benefits of intermittent fasting and controlling the time i mean if you think about it right breakfast breaking the fast right um most people don't think of it that way uh but typically you know when you had to look for food hunt for food there were periods of fasting and that wasn't too long ago in the scheme of how long we've been on this planet that was a blink of an eye ago right so right we 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 just got the ability to have food all the time. So if the human species is, let's say, 100,000 years old, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've only been living in a post-agricultural time for the last 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've been living in a post-agricultural industrial time just for the last couple of hundred years, so 150 years. So when, you know, when they say breakfast is the most important meal meal of the day, I, I question that. In, mm-hmm. in the context of how we live, because we're not fasting long enough when we're sleeping. If you had your last, you know, snack at 9 p.m. and you're waking up at 6 and then eating breakfast, well, that's that's not really fasting. Right. Um, whereas if we were to just say, all right, let's, uh, let's transport ourselves back to New Hampshire 10,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's say we, we, we killed a deer. Mm-hmm. We're enjoying this deer over the... You know, five I'd rather or six be in days. the Caribbean, but uh, we can we can use New Hampshire. Well, I'm using New Hampshire because yeah. if it's February in New Hampshire, mm-hmm. after you finish that deer, what are you going to eat? Yeah, you're going to eat. I don't what? know uh, what was available. What? Good question. Is there anything at the supermarket? No. <laughs> Is there anything? Any bananas coming up from the Caribbean? <sighs> Nothing on ships. <laughs> so, okay. are there any berries on the trees in February? No. Are there any, like, potatoes you could dig out of the ground in February? No, whatever was pickled or stored or whatever. You're not pickling anything 10,000 years ago. Nothing. And And the ground is frozen, covered with about 20 Good inches point. of snow. Good point. You said 10,000, right? So, so, but people did thrive in that environment 10,000 years ago. It's not like there were no people there. Right. They thrived and actually had great uh, societies, right? Mm-hmm. 
So what did they do? Well, then they just waited for the next animal. Mm. And then, all right, so let's say we finish the deer and maybe five days pass before we catch another squirrel or maybe maybe a moose. Mm -hmm. But the point is, during that five days, are we going to be fatigued, tired, lethargic, starving? Mm -hmm. No. No. And and, and I've learned this because I've done multi-day fasts. I've done five-day fasts. I've done two-day fasts, three-day fasts. Um, I do intermittent fasting, you know, within a single day, like Mm -hmm. 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, it's amazing. I mean, my five-day fasts, hunger is the thing I complain about the least. Uh, matter of fact, I'm genuinely hungry when I take my first bite. So so as soon as I start to eat, when I break the fast, mm. then I go. And then nothing's going to pull me from that table. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not starving before I get to the table. If I just know I'm not going to eat in five days, then day two, day three... You, 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 your body goes into ketosis. It's an amazing experience because a lot of people say, no, no, if I don't eat in three hours, my blood sugar drops, I get dizzy, lightheaded. And that's true. That's because you're not adapted Yet. to be able to do that. You've mm-hmm. been living this way for so long. You, you that, that, that software that's mm-hmm. in your genetics hasn't been booted up in mm-hmm. your whole life. It's there, mm-hmm. but you just ne- ne- never brought it out. Mm. So when you feel tired, lethargic, headachey, hangry, mm-hmm. uh, that means you're not adapted to fasting. Right. Which is when you are adapted, you actually get clearer thinking, mm-hmm. more energy. Mm-hmm. You get the you improve your ability to laterally think, to mm-hmm. bring in disparate ideas and and see connections in them. Mm-hmm. I will tell you, fasting is the greatest ADHD drug I've ever I've, I've ever imagined. Wow, that's that's uh, that's important. That's important. You yeah. know, just growing up, just being a male growing up in, in New York City, ADD yeah. is, you know, something we all have a degree of, right? Yeah. You just look at my my, uh, my my laptop and look how many windows I have open that I can't close. That's ADD. Well, especially here in New York, we just, uh, it's like sensory overload 24 yeah. hours, you know, seven days a week. Yeah. When I'm in, in that fasting state, I'm focused, I can read a book, I can sit at my computer, I can be creative. I have energy to exercise and work out. Um, it's really quite an amazing experience, and and it's it's worth. But again, if you were to go from being the kind of person whose blood sugar drops after three hours to starting a multi day fast, you're going to feel horrible. Yeah, it's 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 important. I mean, we're not going to turn this into a the the podcast about fasting, but it's important for the audience to understand that the response is going to be very subjective. Yeah. Based on who you are going into the fast. And right. again, your perceived level of discomfort for certain people fasting for a couple of days, they're they it's mind over matter and they get through that rough period, it's not a big deal and for other people you need to be in a really controlled environment because it's going to be very uncomfortable for you. For some people, it's 12 hours is a lot, and mm-hmm. they need to go from 12 to 13, mm. 13 to 14. So Yeah, yeah. I've done that, 24 hours, and it's honestly, the first 12 hours was difficult, mm-hmm. really difficult. We just didn't feel good. Um, and then after that, uh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Um, I could have gone into a second or a third day uh, comfortably. We're going to have to do a whole podcast mm-hmm. on it. On because, fasting. Because there, there's so much to know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can tell you right now, what, what starts out as difficult becomes actually incredibly easy and beneficial late, later. And, and having knowing what steps, mm-hmm. what progression you can do mm-hmm. um, is, is, is really worthwhile. But again, from a hormesis standpoint, mm-hmm. it's making your body uncomfortable. The body mm-hmm. then has to respond, go into some kind of survival mode Mm -hmm. and become stronger as a result Mm -hmm. um so we have three good examples we have heat uh extreme heat exposure in the mm -hmm. sauna extreme cold exposure either the outdoors or or whatever a cold uh a plunge cryotherapy um we have uh fasting as another type of of controlled hormesis and what are some other examples well different forms of exercise Mm mm-hmm different forms of exercise and body work. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, um, you know, you can look at, uh, you know, again, even chiropractic care where a chiropractor is going to use his hands to, to 
apply a force into the spine. Mm-hmm. Um, the body will then adapt to that force. Now, that force, obviously, in an uncontrolled, violent way, would would be damaging to the body. Right. But in a very controlled, specific uh, way, with intention by by the the trained chiropractor, that force will send a message into the body which will then get the ligaments, muscles, tendons all to create an adaptive response Mm -hmm. to that hormetic um, experience that is the chiropractic adjustment. So so the spine then reacts to to that um, and and it it reacts in a way that is appropriate to protecting itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, also the the science of homeopathy um, where... A uh, homeopath will will give you a, a, an extremely diluted amount of something that would cause the symptom you have mm-hmm. in order for your body to have a hormetic response. So there's really a lot, but as far as what our audience can do at home, well, visiting a chiropractor is always a good idea. You know how I feel. Yeah, about even that. Um, yes, body workers. Like uh, I had a, a therapist a couple of weeks ago who is um, a guy from Oklahoma who's very gifted and. He was wor- he was treating me and uh, he's uh, a rolfer, right? Mm-hmm. So it's rolfing, and he said that the pure uh, treatment of rolfing is a series of treatments. Unlike a lot of other body work, where you go in and it's like, okay, let's see if I can fix you today. Um, it's almost like you have to uh, agree to see the real rolfing practitioner a series of times because it's very progressive. It's about exposing you to something that's really uncomfortable uh, in doses and getting your body to adapt to that. Um, And in the process, you know, treating the lesion or treating the dysfunction, but it's when done properly, it's like, you know, some rolfers will crush you like right out the gate. And that's not, it's supposed to be very, very progressive because they know that they can kind of kick you off the ledge. and that, that, that's another great example. All, all of these things are not things to try a, as a one-off. Right. You're not, you're not going to benefit from fasting, fasting once. Right. Uh, but making, creating an intermittent fasting schedule for your, for, for, your, for your lifestyle and what makes you comfortable is a good idea. Creating a, a uh, cryotherapy or a cold exposure, uh, part, uh, making that part of your routine in your life. For example, uh, some people will just dunk their face into ice water for thirty seconds. Paul Newman style. Yeah, just right. <laughs> that was a that was what a rumor, was right? That? What? Um, no, I, I read an article like a gazillion years ago that he, I mean, because people were like, oh, he, this guy's got incredible skin. Well, he's like, you know, he's a good looking actor. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, he used to say, oh yeah, I would shave in the morning and then have a bucket of ice, <laughs> uh, water, and I see how long I can keep my face in the bucket really? of ice I, water. I, I, I didn't know that. So he was so, practicing this, you know, way back when. As oh, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he thought he was doing it for his skin. He probably benefited a great deal in so many other ways. Exactly. And so I, I remember him. It was either an interview or it was an article that I read on him. And I was like, yeah, you know, this is kind of like... Uh... Anyway, so That's I digress. Cool. <laughs> but in, in sports science, there is a Japanese I, well, principle. I'm sorry, just the... the, the, the thing that uh-huh. I wanted to say was that it, it's it's something that you want to have a progression. You want to incorporate into your life for a period of time. That's why I said earlier, three months is kind of a minimum time to introduce some uh, in, to introduce a concept to determine if it's if you like it, if it's helping you. Yeah. Uh, because if you tried fasting once and got hungry and didn't yeah. like it. Well, then, yeah, of course, there's no reason to do it again. Yeah, that, so. that's a very good point. I think anything that you are going to expose yourself to to see the benefits, I think that 12-week period is kind of a sweet spot. Yeah. And I've, I've learned that through experience. So whether it's, oh, you want to get lean or you want to get strong or you want to improve speed or you want to uh, improve mobility – um, flexibility. Right. I think that you have to kind of think of it in, you know, four phases of three weeks each or 12 weeks of trying something. And that would, that would include, you know, this, this, these different processes of hormesis and, and being able to like see real results. I got to tell you, my, you know, I, I grew up here in, in New York city, uh, you know, the child of, uh, Greek immigrants and, 
uh, fasting was definitely not a part of my life. I wasn't very religious, and I can tell you, eat, eat, eat. My mother, Steve, what are you sick? Yeah, eat. my 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 mother was elbow deep in in <laughs> dough and and every possible you know fish and, and <laughs> lamb and um, every day of my life. So and and she lives a mile away from me now. So mm-hmm. you know, fasting was never a part of my life that I would even think about uh, doing before. I can't imagine not fasting now. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine not fasting. Every, everything I eat is so much more enjoyable now that I have intermittent fasting as part of my life. Yeah, it's a. It's about six or seven years ago. I was speaking to a doctor, and he was from Europe or is from Europe, and he told me about a center, or he called it a clinic, but it's more like you know one of these centers, like a wellness center that all of that a lot of the elite in Europe, particularly in France, go to. I can't remember the name. I think it's called Buckinger, if I'm not mistaken. And it might be in Switzerland. Uh, Don't quote me on that. But uh, you go and it's anyone with any kind of physiological ailment, they go to fast. And it's under medical supervision. So you're there with people from all walks of life that go for a week to 10 days. They wake up in the morning. What was interesting is they wake up in the morning and they have breakfast, but their breakfast, they have water, but socially and they talk and then they go for a hike and then they come back and they might do some other form of exercise in a class or swimming. And then they have lunch, lunch, water, socially, boom. Then they go for a nap, maybe, you know, whatever, see a movie, come back, they have dinner, water, and then do a little bit more exercise. And he said the first three days are tough, but after the third day, it's like somebody just shot you up full of caffeine and, you know, uh, nootropics all at once. Yeah, I mean, and that has to do with the body shifting its uh, fuel source from glucose, which is what most of us have been burning 99.9% of our life. Mm -hmm. Uh, into burning ketones, which is derived from fat. And once you start mobilizing fat, it's a different energy source. It Mm -hmm. utilizes more oxygen or it better utilizes oxygen. There's so many, we're we're going to do a deeper dive into the benefits of ketosis. But that's the experience people have. And I can tell you just anecdotally right now, um, this this is, there's dramatic, implications here with immune problems, uh, particularly as it relates to chronic infections like Lyme, Lyme's disease. And we'll do a deeper dive uh, to go fasting. into the science of what's happening in, in Lyme disease and people who are worried about early dementia, they're worried about cognitive problems if they've been a football player in high school and college and, and they're just cognitively not there. Even our, our pro athletes that, that you and I work with, um, they're concerned about getting into their 40s and 50s and starting to experience the impacts of dementia. Uh, ketosis and intermittent fasting is a major player um, in in resolving these issues. Uh, so I'm very excited about the podcasts that are going to come up where we dive deep and, and have some papers to look at and try to make it understandable for our listeners mm-hmm. without going into the minutia of the science. But we want the science to... Uh, we want to give people the science in a, in a language that they can use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and and apply right away absolutely. after hearing them. Yeah, so with regards to hormesis again and, and exercise, uh, you can call it hormesis, but various science, sports science principles exist uh, in terms of progressive overload. So, and that's what we're talking about is really exposing the central nervous system as well as the physiology of the body an athlete or non-athlete in a very controlled progressive overload and from that progressive overload the adaptive responses will get you the results that you seek based on the qualities that you wanted to improve so what is an example of a progressive overload um so uh for example uh an athlete that wants to get stronger, okay? So first off, you have to define what type of strength you want to improve. Um, Do you want to improve the relative strength, you know, relative to your body weight, for your sport, if you're an MMA fighter, if you're a boxer, 
I have to keep my weight under control, so I want to improve my strength, but I don't really want to increase the cross-section of the muscle and move up a weight class. I want to, you know, really work on my nervous system. If you're an Olympic weightlifter, same thing. I want to stay in a weight class. So there's very successful systems of progressively overloading um, the nervous system and the physiology in order to expose the athlete to doses of that overload that again elicit that adaptive response make you uncomfortable but um it's a very controlled manner and if you look at it on a graph it's usually looks like an undulating curve which is very similar to what you would do in your practice from a functional medicine standpoint with nutrition fasting etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah. when i when i would just to, to stay on the progressive overload concept when mm-hmm. i was a kid going to the gym you know i kind of grew up in the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger built, you know, um, uh, Joe Weider Louis. days. Yeah, Lou Ferrigno. Louis. And, and I'd go to the gym and, and uh, you know, getting stronger meant I was going to uh, do a, a certain weight on the bench press mm-hmm. and then I would do another set a little heavier mm-hmm. and then another set a little heavier and then I would pyramid down and kind of fo- I would read the articles that were always in those silly yeah. uh, magazines. Yeah. So now... I want to know as a a 47 year old man Mm -hmm. um, and I want to still get stronger, but I don't necessarily want to just, you know, increase. I I don't want to get strong to increase my, my bench press. Mm -hmm. I I don't care what my bench press is, Mm. but I want to be stronger in my activities of daily living. I don't want to atrophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to keep my, my lean muscle mass. What would be an example of a progressive routine that's different from the old Joe Weider days? So, so, uh, again, bringing it back to hormesis is, you know, uh, I, what's the quality? So you just want to get stronger for everyday life. Well, no, not everyday life. I'm going to, uh, there's things I enjoy doing. So I, I enjoy mountain climbing. I, I, I enjoy doing a tough mutter, a Spartan mm-hmm. race. So, so I'm going to want to be stronger and fitter to be able to lift my own body weight up over an obstacle, Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things. So I do have more specific goals. Okay, so then let's call that relative strength. Um, Relative to your body weight or while bringing your body weight down, you want to increase that quality of strength. Um, Then you could do a method which is uh, a a wave loading type method where you are taking particular lifts once you know exactly the exercises that you're going to do in the gym um, and you're going to increase uh, one to three percent you know every other workout type thing Um, and you're going to wave load them by decreasing your reps and increasing the percentage of weight that you're using by one to three percent You could also increase your relative strength by decreasing your rest period. So now you don't have that same measured rest period. Let's say that it was 90 seconds to two minutes rest in between sets. Now you've progressively decreased the rest interval, but you've kept the weight the same. There's many different methods. And quite frankly, the most important thing to remember is that your body adapts to the method rather quickly and the more trained that you are the quicker it will adapt so again back to that i got to try it for 12 weeks you have to stay with a routine but only for as long as that routine works and that's important for the audience because what i see in the gym and outside of the gym too both recreationally and professionally is that Guys, A, are doing the same stuff all the time, and their goal is just to increase the amount of weight that they're using, but they don't realize the body adapts to the exercises, the ranges of motion, the rep protocol. So, hey, man, I may only do three exercises, but I can change those other loading parameters and with hormesis progressively overload by manipulating those other loading parameters and get the body to adapt differently. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do a progressive overload podcast at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many methods of getting stronger, and it's so misunderstood. There's so much BS out there in terms of, you know, getting stronger. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, It's actually 
something that's very measurable and it's something that a lot of coaches and sports scientists have been very successful at for a long time. Excellent. All right. So th- this this topic today, hormesis, I think we covered some pretty good yep. ground here on on get, getting, um, you know, as a foundational podcast for the Thrivalist Manifesto. Uh, I, I think this is going to be something we refer back to over and over. Again, how do you thrive, not survive? One of the methods you thrive is by adapting or incorporating different methods that will make your body, your brain, your psychology, your spirit a bit uncomfortable, but you come out of them stronger and operating at a higher level. And on that note, till next time, this is Ben V and Dr. G from the Thrivalist Manifesto.